Okay, yesterday we looked at uh, the triumvirate, the first triumvirate, and how um, Julius Caesar was a, ma a major part of that triumvirate. Today, what we're going to look at is Julius Caesar, and we're going to go back and review some of the things that he did in that first triumvirate. The amazing thing is, is that Julius Caesar actually created himself and built himself up during that first triumvirate time period. His, in fact, the, one of the themes I see developing in history at this time is this ability for people to create a mythology about themselves. And it's not just something that happens in ancient times, it happens all the way through history. Um, when I look at World War II, Joseph Stalin was amazing at how he created his myth about himself. Hitler did the same thing. Uh, some people wait till later in their life, like Winston Churchill, he wrote, uh, his biography, his autobiography, and built himself up in a lot of ways. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of things in our vocabulary today, propaganda, chronicles, propaganda can be the truth. In fact, during World War II, Americans just used German propaganda as our own propaganda because we saw it through a different lens. And so uh, that, that theme maintained all the way through Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar. Um, on the vocab list, I do have these words, the cult of personality, where someone, uh, usually a public figure, can deliberately present themselves to the people and they build themselves up. We'll see Julius Caesar do this. Um, the Gaelic people, or Gallic, uh, that just refers to the people who live in Gaul. Uh, the Chronicle, it's a history. It's like they actually write down what happened and propaganda is information used to build somebody up or something up and it can have some truth to it but it's just the way you present it now with julius caesar um what he did in gaul was very important because as he went into gaul he used that time in gaul to create himself now, the way he did this is he'd write down these chronicles daily about his conquest of, of Gaul. Um, for example, there was a time where he built this thousand foot bridge, 55 BCE. Uh, he went up into northern uh, boundaries of the Roman Empire, or what would be the Roman Empire, and he built a thousand foot bridge in 10 days that crossed the Rhine River. And then he went into Germany and he attacked the Germanic people for about three weeks before he came back and tore the bridge down. Uh, what he was showing the Germans was that he could go anywhere he wanted to, that a river, a thousand foot wide river, wasn't going to stop him. Uh, but it also showed the people back in Rome because he'd send these letters back home to Rome and they'd read them out in the streets. That was the newscast of the day. Uh, you'd have these chroniclers or these people that would call out the, the the happenings around the empire and Julius Caesar made sure that he got his voice heard in those people's um, callings on the street corners. Now, another thing he did is, this is later on in his in Gaul, but he attacked the city of Alicia. Now, Alicia was controlled by the Gallic chiefs, and I do want to come down here because uh, when we have Alicia, we have this city, it's right in that area right there. Alicia was controlled by uh, the Gallic chiefs, uh, Vercingetorix, or Vercingetorix, and um, Vercingetorix was a was a pretty adept at battling Caesar. Uh, Vercingetorix's main ability to fight Caesar was his cavalry. He could use the horse soldiers very quickly and could outrun and outmaneuver the, the legions that, hit, uh, that Caesar had. But Caesar tracked Vercingetorix in the city of Alicia. And what he did is he built a 20 mile wall around that city so he could make sure that no one left that city and that if Vercingetorix tried to attack to get out, he had to go through a wall to get through it. Then um, Vercingetorix did get some people out before the wall was built and they brought in some other troops and they came in and tried to attack um, Julius Caesar. And Julius Caesar built another wall around the inner wall that was around the city and so the roman legions were between in this donate donut shaped fort around the city of alicia he's able to defeat the forces from without and then he was able to starve the city out 
Eventually, Vercingetorix surrendered. Some people say he just walked out of the city, walked into the Roman camp, and said, here I am, and they took him. Uh, Vercingetorix used to be, was used as a propaganda tool because uh, Julius Caesar brought Vercingetorix back to Rome and marched him through the streets of Roman chains. And his imposing figure showed the Roman people what Julius Caesar could do. The Roman soldiers back in this time were pretty short. Uh, and I think Vercingetorix was a pretty large and dominating figure. I haven't looked up his, up his body size, but that's the impression I get when I read about him. Now, before Julius Caesar even crosses that Rubicon River in 49 BCE, uh, the people know about him, and they kind of see him as a superhero. And so as he returns to Rome and he crosses the river, a lot of people probably say, finally, we got to get somebody to come back here. Now, Pompey... Uh, he did have his following too, but his victories seemed so long ago in the past. Uh, he defeated the, the Parthians back in the 60s BCE. So 10, 15 years before he had done his major work. And so he was seen as a has-been in a lot of ways. And so when Julius Caesar came back into Rome, um, Pompey wasn't ready for it. Pompey did not anticipate Julius Caesar doing this. Another thing that I see developing in the time frame is swift and decisive action. Julius Caesar used swift, decisive action to catch his opponents off guard. We'll see that in Octavian, too, later on. And so Pompey comes in with his troops, crosses the Rubicon. Uh, Pompey is not able to, to meet Julius Caesar in the field, and he flees to Greece, where some of his troops are. Pompey also has some of his troops in, in Spain. And Julius Caesar goes to Spain, defeats his troops there, then he turns to Greece and defeats Pompey's troops there. Uh, and Pompey retreated down to Egypt. Now, in Egypt, we have Ptolemy the 13th, and he's about 11, 12, 13 years old. He's not an old kid. And Ptolemy the 13th, seeking to uh, get on the good side of Julius Caesar, kills Pompey. And um, Julius Caesar doesn't actually like that very much. And so eventually, uh, Pom or Ptolemy is, is killed as well, and anyone that was involved in the killing of Pompey is also killed. Uh, and this is where Julius Caesar meets up with Cleopatra, and they do end up having a child together. And Cleopatra claims that this son that she has is Julius Caesar's, and I haven't seen anything that refutes it, but in Roman tradition, it's the father who can decide if the son or the child is his. And so uh, Julius Caesar never recognizes Caesarian as his own son. Now, when Julius Caesar returns to Rome in 46 BCE, uh, he is welcomed as a conquering hero. And the Senate is still battling Julius Caesar in a lot of these ways. But Julius Caesar does some things that kind of set himself up. Uh, one, he's at the pinnacle of his power, the very top of his power. But the, he starts to overreach in a lot of ways. One, the Senate votes that he can wear a purple toga. Okay, it may not seem like a big deal, but purple is a color reserved for kings. Uh, there's another instance uh, in Rome where he is on the Appian Way, which is the main road south of Rome. And the people start yelling Rex. Rex means king. And uh, the people who started that chant are arrested. And Julius Caesar has the people who arrested the people on the chant lose their jobs. Um, right before he is killed, he is supposedly going into the Senate to have them approve his, um, his ability to be called Rex outside the provinces. Not in Rome, not in the center part of the, the empire or the, the republic, but out of the provinces. He will take on that term king. And that is when, in the theater of Pompeii, as he comes in, uh, they separate him out from his guards. Uh, they take Mark Anthony. They, he's distracted. And people approach Julius Caesar with petitions, saying, hey, I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that for me. And they crush him around him. And as they get him pinned in, they take out their daggers and kill him. Um, now... Next time we look at this, we're going to be looking at the um, second triumvirate and how Mark Anthony was able to be swift and decisive and how he reacted to that. 
Now, today, I want you to look at the vocabulary and look at the difference between chronicle and propaganda and see how those words are used. And answer some of the other questions down there. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. I'll be glad to talk to you and take care.